All right. Good morning, everyone. I think we're uh, not. I think we're ready to get started. Before we uh, do get going again, I just want to welcome each and every one of you to Ascent Bible Church. Those of you joining us online, want to wish everybody a happy Fourth Independence Day. We uh, gathered for prayer this morning and. Uh, one of our prayer points for our Sunday morning prayer time was, again, as the church, as the body of Christ, really praying up our nation, uh, desperately needs to turn its turn back to the Lord. And um, as we were all gathered and discussing um, some practical ways how that needs to happen, really it falls on us, the church, the body of Christ, to be that light, to be the salt. So... Uh, um, those of you that are a part of this body, uh, both in-house to this morning and all joining us online, it's on us. we got to own what's going on in this world and uh, really, really um, be that testimony that this world, this dark, very um, hopeless world, desperately needs Jesus like never before. Having said that, I just, again, want to welcome each and every one of you. This is going to be an exciting month for our church you're going to get to hear from some of our pastors, other leaders in this body um, in uh, the month of July and early August. Uh, while I go to the back and hang out with the youth group, we're going to start uh, discipleship with them. Um, excited about that. Just finished with Diego and Jacob a few months ago. Christy, where's Christy? She's back behind me. <laughs> Christy and Dolores finished, what, two weeks ago? Yes. Mm. So... Um, Christy's going to help me teach. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I'm so grateful for our youth and the way they're stepping up and uh, just uh, taking that step in their journey. So be praying for me as I spend time with them and, um, and hang out. So uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Mike, both for leading the praise and the preaching this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning just grateful, just... Uh, in awe, Lord, of your goodness and your love for us. And I just pray this morning, Lord, as we do gather as a, as a church, as a nation, uh, Lord, your word says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And Lord, I do pray for our country and ask that um, you would bring about healing, Lord, in every aspect. Uh, just let us look to you again, Lord, and just uh, ask that you would have your way in the hearts of um, each and every citizen. Lord, I just uh, pray that as we gather this, this month to consider um, what it is that you're doing in this body, I just pray that we would continue to just look to you as you guide us, as you direct us, as we stay committed to your mission, Lord, and that is to see the lost saved, Lord, and the saved discipled. Be with us now, Lord, and we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good to see you all. Um, we have a great privilege uh, this morning of meeting with our God this morning again and praising Him, and so thankful for another uh, Sunday He gives us before He returns. Um, your participation, you're the, you're the choir, we're going to lead, but you're the choir, and the worship, uh, praise and worship is for uh, one person and one person only, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to have you, if you would, please go ahead and stand as we begin our worship. Let 
John 4, 9 through 10. And this was manifested, the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins.
tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden i am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and i realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If his grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. And heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss. And my heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way. Even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. But we will, be, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean singing how He took my 
I've been blessed uh, over the last months working with these two young ladies uh, just to see how God's using them and um, just to see their, their gift being uh, improved basically every week. And uh, I'm just excited what God has for them in the, in the years to come, how God's going to use them. Um, we're going to be talking about prayer today, and I was just really hoping that somebody knew this song. And uh, Chrissy says, I know this. And it's a great song, and um, one of my favorites. Uh, Ruthie, my daughter, used to sing this and basically brought me to tears, but, <laughs> but it's a great song. ready 
to begin the, the days when I feel I'm letting go and soaring on the way cause I've learned in laughter or in pain how to survive I get on my knees I get on So it's good to be uh, with you this morning, and uh, John has asked me to teach today on prayer. And when I was considering this particular topic, it is like huge and vast and deep, and there's no way we can do a comprehensive study on prayer in just uh, 14 hours. No, we're going to be here 14 hours, just within 15 minutes. Um, I kind of think of... um, Myself with this particular topic, like this little boy who was on the ocean or next to the shore, and he built, a, he dug a hole in the sand, and he decided that he is with his bucket, he is going to put all the ocean water <laughs> into the, the hole. That's kind of I think uh, I feel when I look at this topic here. But I really hope that our time together is going to be one where um, you'll be able to appreciate uh, prayer more, and more importantly. Um, There'll be a greater application of prayer in your life to draw you close to the heart of God. Uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, when it comes to prayer, there's been a lot of confusion as to its purpose as well as its practice. It's kind of like the story I heard about this small Kentucky uh, town where they had two churches and they had one whiskey uh, distillery. And uh, members of both churches complained that the uh, whiskey distillery was giving the town a bad image. And in addition to that, um, the whiskey distillery owner was an atheist. 
So they tried as they could to shut down the uh, whiskey distillery, but they couldn't do it, so they decided they would have a prayer meeting. So Saturday they get together, and they have a prayer meeting, and all through the night as they begin to pray, the storm comes. And the storm all of a sudden brings a uh, lightning strike, and guess where it hits? Right at the whiskey distillery, and absolutely devastates the whole place. It's done, it's burnt to the ground. So, uh, of course, to the delight of the church members, the next day was Sunday, and you guessed the uh, topic of the sermon was the power of prayer. But the uh, fire insurance people came by, and they, of course, went and investigated what happened, and so they come to the owner and they say, look, um, your policy doesn't cover this because this is called an act of God. Well, the uh, whiskey distillery guy was not very happy about this because he decided he was going to sue all the church members because they dis conspired together with God to destroy his place. <laughs> well, um, it goes to trial and the judge listens to both sides and then he concludes this thing. He says, I find one thing about this case very perplexing. We have a situation where the plaintiff, who is an atheist, is professing his believing, belief in the power of prayer, and the defendants, the church members, are denying its prayer. <laughs> <laughs> I think, unfortunately, uh, the judge speaks to what goes on today, actually, in prayer. Uh, from the time of Christ, there's been a whole lot of confusion as to its purpose. And I think uh, amongst church people, uh, there's no argument that uh, prayer is significant in our lives. In fact, someone said this. They said that prayer uh, is to our spiritual life like breathing is to our physical life. And uh, if you think about that, uh, it's critical, right? It should be critical. Breathing is critical. It's essential, and it should be constant, if we stop breathing, our physical life is going to be altered. And listen, if we stop breathing, our spiritual life is going to be altered. This morning, I got up early and I was thinking, what are the steps of lack of oxygen to the brain? And I thought it was very interesting. These are the things that I got from the Internet. They said, lack of oxygen, this is the way it begins. You begin to feel disoriented and confused. The next step is you get an altered... Um, direction in your life, you become disoriented. Then you have a difficult time making decisions. And then eventually it's comatose and it's also death. I thought, isn't that interesting with the prayer life as well? You move away from God in your prayer life, believe me, you're going to start to feel a little disoriented. And you keep going in that direction, God says eventually you're going to be in a comatose state in your Christian life. See uh, S. Spurgeon he was lamenting about the declining prayer life in the church, and he said this. He said, Brethren, we shall never see much change for the better in our churches until the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. This is a great uh, quote from Samuel Chadwick. He wrote this concerning prayer. He says, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. What a great quote. See, one of the real, um, one of the real temptations to imagine that prayer is a dispensable thing. We got to know that um, nowhere does Satan work more gruelingly and successfully in the lives of Christians and to keep them away from prayer. Because the devil knows this. When we go to God in prayer, that is where we're going to find our strength and perspective. And so he's going to oppose us with all uh, that he can. And that's where we get the supernatural empowerment from God to continue in life and do what God has called us to do. I don't know how you feel about prayer, but it's pretty easy to come up with an excuse why not to pray, right? Probably all of us have been there, done that. It's too busy. My day's too full, right? Prayer time's not at the right time. It's all these things that we bring to God, but God's not going to buy a bit of it because our spiritual life, listen carefully, it rests on prayer. 
So let's begin this way. Let's begin with a definition of prayer. And this, by the way, when we go through this study, it is an, an absolute a no way to insult your intelligence about Scripture or about some of these topics, but I've learned to uh, not make assumptions with anyone. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep it on the base level here. But I want to give you a definition of prayer because it's pretty simple. I think we can use this. Prayer is both a conversation and it's an encounter with God. Pretty simple. A conversation, an encounter with God. And the first time we see this expressed is in Genesis chapter 3. You remember that chapter where Adam sins, he and his wife go now, they hide behind the bushes, and um, God comes seeking for them. And this is what God says to him. Where art thou? What a great question. Now, uh, God was not uh, asking geographical questions, was he? No, he's asking about the heart. It wasn't about geography, it was about the relationship. But the thing I want to point out is that there are always only two people represented in prayer. It's only you and God, you and God. And no one else. And, and really, when you look at a congregation like this, there's plenty of us here. We're going to pray, and there's lots of us here. But ultimately, it is the real prayer, is a conversation directly between the person praying and God himself. And by the way, don't need to probably say this, but I'll say it anyway. We're never to pray to people, but we're to pray for people, right? Uh, some of us came from a background that was a little bit different, but we're to pray for people. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, prayer, uh, praise is for one purpose only, and it's only for one person only, and that's for God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when it comes to prayer, it's the same thing. It's for one audience and one audience only. It's not to impress people. I don't know if you've been around certain uh, circles of prayer where all of a sudden they are using words that you don't even understand. Jesus dealt with this in Matthew chapter 6 verse 5, as he taught the disciples first how not to pray. I thought that was very interesting. He taught them how not to pray before he taught them to pray. And he said this in Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. He said, And when thou dost pray, or prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen, and I can say it, heard by men. In other words, their focus was not on God, but themselves. Hypocritical prayer. Reminds me of a, a brand new believer who was excited about his faith. And uh, these church members who were a little bit more mature, they saw this in his life, and they invited him to a prayer meeting and decided, no, we need to kind of help this young man learn uh, the ropes about spirituality. So they invited him to the prayer meeting, it's time to pray, and they're all kind of in a circle. And I don't know how you guys feel about it, uh, being in the circle and praying, and everybody goes one by one. I remember when I was a young believer, it frightened me to death. <laughs> I didn't know exactly how to pray, and it was my turn. Well, here's this young man. I can relate to this. And um, these uh, older gentlemen that were praying, and of course they're using all the thous and these, and all this incredible flowery language. Uh, and it comes down to this young man praying, and he just, uh, he just sends up a prayer, oh God, I just need your help. That's about it. <laughs> and so these older uh, gentlemen at the prayer means over, they said, hey, uh, young man, um, it's not the way, quite the way you should pray. There's some other words you should be saying. And the young man, I love this, he said, I wasn't talking to you. Well, the second thing that Jesus says about how not to pray, he says this, and when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathens do. One was hypocritical prayer, the other one was what? It was this religiosity. A lot of words meaning nothing, meaningless words, basically. There's a lot of us who grew up in that environment. I grew up in that environment. The whole idea that if you say this one prayer over and over and over and over again, Somehow God's going to listen to you. Evidently, you need to badger him, or he's hard of hearing. I wasn't sure which one it was, but I, I said it over and over again. I think it's interesting here that Jesus says, don't pray as the heathen pray. Do you find that interesting, that the heathen pray? Why do the heathen pray? You know why? Because Ecclesiastes 3.11. God has put what? Eternity in their heart. They know that there's something more beyond themselves. Do you guys realize that uh, the atheists have a prayer line? I'll give you the number. It's 1-800-NOT-THERE. 
So you dial it up and nobody answers. Anyway, they have their own prayer life. So to help us get started on this for kind of big perspective on uh, prayer in the life of a believer, we're going we're gonna to look at four different things today. We're going to look at the priority of prayer. That's really, really important. Uh, how does that fit into Scripture? What does Scripture have to say about it? We're going to be looking at the pattern of prayer. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at the pattern that Jesus gave us in Matthew 6. Purpose of prayer. Why do we pray? And then uh, we'll look at the practice of prayer. So let's look at the priority of prayer. There are two spiritual activities that should occupy every believer's life on a continual basis. Now, if you've come to uh, Ascend Church, you know one of them for sure. That's the Word of God, right? You hear John talking about the importance of getting into the Word of God. This should be unceasing activity in the believer's life. These are the two pillars that are going to hold up the believer's life and... uh, the matters of living. So one is the study of God's word, the other is prayer. And this was voiced, by the way, in Acts chapter 6, verse 4, when the apostles said this, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the study of God's word is God speaking to us, prayer is us speaking to him. And this is wonderfully shown in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. How how saturated should your your life be with the Word of God? We'll look at prayer in just a minute. But when it comes to the Word of God, how saturated should your life be? Chapter 6 of Deuteronomy says this. When it comes to the Word of God, this is what uh, Moses was delivering to the nation of Israel to lay out as far as how the law was supposed to saturate life. He said this. You're to take the Word of God and you're to meditate on it and use it when you sit down, when you stand up, when you lie down. When you're walking in the way, he says, bind it on your hands, bind it on your foreheads, and put it on your house. I mean, it's the whole idea of saturating your life with the Word of God. In fact, if you guys were here with, as many of you were, for the study in Joshua, Joshua 1.8, says this, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, it, meditate on it. How long? Night and day. And so it is with prayer. The apostle Paul says this in several passages, you're to pray without ceasing, pray always with all prayer and supplication in everything by prayer with thanksgiving, make your request be known unto God. In other words, prayer is to be unceasing always and in everything. So how do you do that? If if that's the command God has given us, how do you practically do that? Well, let me give you some uh, ways you can do that. When you wake up in the morning, you can pray and say, God, thank you for a new day, right? When you jump into the shower, you can pray, oh, God, thank you for the water that you give us. And I'm sure we are going to thank you also for taking a shower when you come to church. It'll be both ways. See, we can pray as well. When you wake up and see your wife, you can say, thank you, God, for a partner you give me to walk through life. When you see your children in the morning, you can pray, thank you, God, for the hope we have for the future in these kids. And God, that one day they're going to leave the house. Thank you, God, for that. (laughs) When you get into your car, you can thank God for your transportation, right? Thank you, God, for giving me a vehicle to get me to where I need to go. When you get through traffic, thank you, God, for getting me through traffic here in Santa Fe that I've been killed. (laughs) And these crazy drivers. When you get to work, you thank God for the job he's given you, to earn money, to buy the things you need. When you get to work and you're with your workers, you say, thank you, God, for a place of evangelism, a place I can share the gospel, a way I can present Christ to those around me. And when you get home, thank you, God, for a home to come where there's peace, a place of refuge. And when you get ready for bed and you're all done and you look yourself in the mirror, you say, thank God. (laughs) God, you're going to get rid of this body and one day you're going to give me a new one. (laughs) I'll tell you what, the older you get, that's the bigger prayer that you have every day. I love the story of Nehemiah. If you look at that story, it's a wonderful story. And One of the things you know about Nehemiah is a man of prayer. And I love this whole idea that you can pray anytime, anywhere. 
God calls him and says, man, you're the man I'm going to use. Of course, he's up in Persia. Uh, he's kind of the right man, the right-hand man of the king. And he decides and goes to the king and says, man, I, God's calling me to go build a wall. And king, God used the, the king in a mighty way. Not only did he give the permission, but he says, tell me what you want. And when, when the king said, tell me what you want, you see that little passage in Nehemiah chapter 2, where it says, Nehemiah prayed. In other words, the question was there. Before he even answered the king, he just shot up a prayer. Isn't that great? You can do it. The whole point is you can pray all the time. There's not as, these set times are wonderful, but God says pray unceasingly. Well, prayer is, again, not an add-on to the believer's life, but it's really our lifeline, and that's what Jesus had in mind in his great uh, prayer on the Sermon on the Mount when he said, when you pray, right? When, not if you pray, but when you pray, and he implies again that it's going to be consistent. So one of the things we want to look at is the priority of prayer in the early church. From its very inception, uh, believers were devoted to prayer, and immediately after Jesus' ascension to heaven, if you remember in chapter 1, the 11 disciples plus other followers of Jesus go to the upper room in Jerusalem. And it's there where they are there because of the command of Jesus. says, I want you to go there and I want you to wait for the promise of what? The Holy Spirit. They're waiting on the Holy Spirit. And I think what's really interesting is, is not so much that they were there, but what they were doing. If you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says this. These all continued with one accord with prayer and supplication. And there's two things I want you to note there. First of all, unity. It says they were all there together. And it's not so much that they just gathered. It mainly what you want to look at here is that they had a singular focus. That's so important. As a church, we need to have a singular focus. We have all things in our life that we pray about, right? There's things that we pray about. When it comes to corporate worship, there should be a unity and a, and a focus that we have of what God wants to do in this fellowship. And secondly, I want you to look at this. It was persistent prayer. They all continued. They all continued. In other words, you heard, I don't know if you guys have heard this, this particular phrase called praying through. Praying through means you stick at it until God says one thing or the other, right? Praying through something. I would venture to say that some of you here in this fellowship have been praying for a week or two on something. Some of you have been praying for a month on something. Some of you guys have been praying for a year on some particular thing. And some of you have been praying for decades on something. Don't stop. Don't stop praying. Continue to pray and, and raise up your concerns to God. And he is faithful to answer. Well, the church began to resolve, uh, began with resolve not to do anything except through prayer. I love that. That's where they began. And that wait to hear from God for further revelation. And I want you to see this, that prayer was not their last resort. It was their first resort. I don't know how you guys do with prayer. I know it is my, my life sometimes. Things come up. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try and fix it, right? I'm going to figure out how am I going to do it. Rather than saying, God, how are you going to do it? Tell me, God, what your plan is, right? And unfortunately, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do that, and we'll come to the end of ourselves, and I go, well, I guess nothing else works, so I guess I might as well what? I might as well pray, <laughs> right? Where God says, no, you got it all backwards. You need to come, you need to come to me first. It's not the last resort, it's the first resort. Well, the principle I want you to see here in Acts 114 is that you're going to know what to pray for. Listen carefully. You're going to know what to pray for through the revelation of God's word. That's how you know how to pray, when God reveals through his word what he wants you to pray for, right? So the prior to the, a prayer in the early church was demonstrated also in Acts 2.42, a familiar passage you guys are aware of. It was one of four elements that God gave to the church. These are the things that are significant. These are the things you didn't vary on in corporate worship. It says this, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. The apostles' doctrine is basically the Word of God, studying the Word of God. 
fellowship was just coming together as a body of Christ, ministering one to another. The breaking of bread, I think, was communion, but it was also a meal that they had usually after. Uh, church service was not an hour, an hour and a half. Church service probably all day long. And then, of course, prayers. So the church was uh, birthed out of prayer. It was established through prayer, and it continued as it grew through prayer, reaching uh, the world with the gospel of Christ. And it just remained that central element in the life of the church as recorded in the book of Acts. We're going to go through a few verses again so you get a sense again of the early church and how prayer was very significant. In Acts 1.24, the disciples prayed for the replacement of Judas Iscariot. Acts 4, 13 through 31, uh, Paul and John are, are threatened by religious leaders. And uh, because of the healing of the sick man, and then when they're released, what you see them is break out into prayer, and God blessed them. And I love this, but the result of all of what happened, God shook the room. I believe that God can still shake a room. I don't know how you guys feel, but I think when people get really serious about seeking him, I think he can shake a room still. I don't think that's beyond him. Acts chapter 6 records the account of an internal problem the church had uh, with favoritism and the distribution of food. And so to solve this, uh, the apostles chose seven men, I love this, chose seven men of good reputation, filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and were chosen to serve. You know what these guys were? They were uh, waiters on tables. And don't you love it that God says even waiters on tables should have integrity, filled with the Spirit? I, I just love that. It's not just another job. Anything we do for God, what is significant, right? Significant. And we should do the, the very best with the right um, heart. Acts chapter 9, verse 40. Peter prayed for the healing of Tabitha. In Acts chapter 10, verse 9. What a great passage. Peter goes up to the Roof to pray. Remember that? He had a problem with prejudice, by the way. A serious problem with prejudice. God says, we need to clear up some things about the way you feel about Gentiles. So he goes up to the roof to pray. And while he's there, God puts out a smorgasbord. And he's got both clean food and unclean food. Uh, on the one side, it was kosher. On the other side, shellfish and some little piggies. Right? <laughs> And God says, take and eat. And Peter says, nope, no, Lord. You can't say no, Lord. You know, that those are oxymorons, right? You say, yes, Lord, no, but never no, Lord. But he does. And I think his life was changed forever. You know why? Because for the very first time in his life, he had chicharrones. <laughs> he was never the same. Changed his life completely. Acts 13.3, Barnabas and Saul are set apart for the ministry. In Acts 16.25, Paul and Silas are in jail. And what they're doing there, they're having a concert, man. They're praying and they're singing. I mean, you can go through the book of Acts. You'll see this over and over again, the, the significance, the priority of prayer. I think more important is to see the priority of prayer in Jesus' life. That's where I want to go. The Gospels record that Jesus praying at least 25 times. His ministry, as you know, began with prayer. You remember when he was baptized? In Luke chapter 3, 21, it says, while he is praying, heaven was opened. That's how he began his ministry. You know how he ended his ministry, right? On the cross with prayer. With prayer. Father, unto thee I commit my spirit. Jesus prayed when he was healing people. He prayed in the morning. He prayed at times all night. He prayed when choosing the twelve at the transfiguration. He prayed before feeding miracles, when he was tempted in the wilderness, at the Last Supper, on the Garden of Gethsemane. Go on and on and on His significance of prayer. You know what's really significant? What absolutely is amazing? Jesus is still praying. Do you realize that? He's still praying. Listen to this passage. I think this is amazing. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says this, Wherefore he, speaking of Jesus, is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he liveth 
he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Isn't that amazing? Do you realize that Jesus is praying for you right now? I don't know how you guys feel about that. I feel pretty good about that. I, I appreciate people praying for me. But to think that Jesus is praying for me, oh boy, what a blessing. Listen, if Jesus elevated prayer to that priority, the question is, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? So let's look at the pattern of prayer. I think many of us grew up uh, from our earliest memories being taught how to pray. Um, I think Pastor John mentioned this last week. This little prayer that, uh, you know, when you put kids to sleep, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's a frightening prayer, by the way, for a kid. <laughs> I don't know, if you really analyze that, that's a little scary. <laughs> but you know there is a prayer, a uh, pra parent's prayer, that's very similar to that for, pa for parents. This is what it says. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my sanity to keep. <laughs> for... If some peace I do not find, I'm pretty sure I'll lose my mind. <laughs> and you who have had children, you pray that often. They estimate that there's um, about 55% of the United States prays population-wise. I, I think that's a little high, but th those are stats. Even though, even though prayer is part of a great number of people's lives, even though many people pray with really sometimes great uh, frequency and uh, fervency, it doesn't mean that the prayers are effective or even that they're acceptable to God. Just because you pray doesn't mean God's going to accept your prayer. That is why God has given us patterns of prayer in the Scripture. Patterns. One of the great patterns I love is the one that is found in James chapter 5, verse 16. Here's what it says. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And the context of this particular uh, passage has to do with praying for the comfort of those people who are hurting and suffering, as well as the evidence of the power of prayer. And James uses the example of Elijah. In verses 17 and 18, it gives us the specifics of what Elijah prayed for, you know, the, the the rain came, the rain didn't come. That, you, you can read it in, in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. But that's not the thrust of the prayer. The thrust of the prayer is not the prayer, but the person. The person. And notice how James describes Elijah. He says this, He was a man who was subject to passions as we are. Now, what, what does that mean? It just means this. He was subject to all of life's challenges just as we are. That's all it's saying. He, he was just like us. His title as prophet is not what made his prayers powerful. It's not his title. It was his relationship with God what made them powerful prayers. I, I think you know this, but pastors don't have a different line to God than you do. <laughs> So some people think they do. When I was pastoring out in Las Vegas, I tell you what, if I went to somebody's house to eat and I was there eating with them, guess who got to say the prayer? Pastor, would you please pray for us? I'm going, no, I'm hungry. I'd rather eat. But let somebody else pray. <laughs> but, but somehow they believe that the pastor has like a, a, a direct line where the rest of you have to be, you know, dial up differently. No, it's not, the way, it's not the way it works. Effectual prayer that availeth much, I want you to see this. This is really critical. It begins with righteousness. Righteousness. 1 Peter 3.12 says this, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. How is your prayer going to availeth much? It's when you're in a right relationship with God. That's how. Listen to this passage also in Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. 
So here, this is how it works. Over the years, I've come across a whole lot of couples who are living together. They're both believers. We have to deal with that. <laughs> and um, I'll sit down with them, and uh, of course, they go through all the incredible excuses like nobody else has heard before. But you don't understand, Pastor, we just love each other. <laughs> I'm going, oh, really? That's nice. Your love's not going to hold you together, first of all. It's going to be your commitment, but that's fine. God, God doesn't buy that. When God says sex out of marriage is immorality and sin, that's what he means, period. And he's not going to buy an excuse that you just love each other. He'd be, that's why you do it. And I tell him, you want God's blessing on that relationship, you better start doing what's right. You better start to repent and change your direction. Because God's not going to hear your prayer. Don't ask God to bless your life when you're in sin. Do not ask him to do that because it won't happen. Answered prayer comes from a righteous heart. That's where it begins, being righteous with God. Psalm 24, 3 and 4 says this. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Before God, your actions are righteous and your motives are right. Who hath not lifted his soul into vanity nor sworn deceitfully. How are you going to have effective prayer? Let me tell you how you're going to have effective prayer. You're going to have a right relationship with God first. That's where it begins. You and God are on the same page. Secondly, you're going to have the right motives. Your heart's going to be right of why you're doing what you're doing, why you're asking what you're asking for. And then you're going to have the right requests. God's going to lead you to the right requests. What a contrast to the heresy that's promoted as the prosperity gospel. You're familiar with prosperity gospel, right? A lot of you are familiar with prosperity gospel. This is known as the name it and claim it or the gab it and grab it, either one. This kind of prayer, it, it becomes a personal force, a creative force, an energy by which you can have any object, you can have any experience, any situation you want. I call that spiritual entitlement in the negative sense. It works like this. You know what you want. You believe you'll receive it. You visualize it. You speak it into existence. One writer described this kind of prayer this way. It works every time. Just put in your order. What a joke. You know what things you'll never find in that prosperity gospel prayers? You're never going to find these things. Holiness. Humility. Brokenness. Submissiveness. You won't find those in those prayers, but what you are going to find in those prayers is, I need the perfect body. I'd like to have some hair. or oh, whatever. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. One day it will. I have a picture of me looking like Fabio one day one day. That's, I say, God, that, that, that one. Not, not when he's old. <laughs> if you've seen Fabio now, you don't want to look at Fabio now. You look at Fabio a long time ago. They're going to be praying for the big house, the upscale sports car, the big bank account. Listen, their view of God is this. God is just up there in heaven waiting for, like a, like a genie, you know, just rub it, and he's going to appear, and he's going to give you all your little wishes make you just as happy as you can be. You know what God calls this attitude? This is amazing. He calls this adultery. He calls it adultery. And he calls it being an enemy of God. How do we know that? Because James told us that. That's why. Look at James 3, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. He says, Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss. You're not asking for the right things. That ye may consume it upon your lusts. That's what it's about. 
you, ad- and this is what he says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And whoever, whosoever, therefore, be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Wow. That's powerful stuff, don't you think? Powerful stuff. In other words, he's saying you're having an affair with the world. Your love is not for me. Your love is for stuff. See, that kind of prayer is telling God it's not about what you want, it's about what I want. In other words, I don't exist to serve you. You exist to serve me. Oh boy, that's called blasphemy. That's what that's called. What did Jesus tell the church believers? This is what he said. But seek ye first what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these other things are going to be added to you. Get it right. Do the first things first. God says, then I'll take care of the second things for you. See, our prayers availeth much when we're in the right relationship, that vertical relationship. Our motives and our requests line up with God. And I love this. Jesus said something incredible. And you've got to listen to the Word of God. You've got to listen carefully to the words. This is what he said in John 14, 14. He said this, And whosoever ye shall, as, as in my name, that will I do. Whatever you shall ask in my name, I shall do. Do you find that amazing? I, I find that amazing. But, but here's the issue. What does it mean in Jesus' name? Now, I would venture to say that probably 99% of you, maybe 100% of you, when you pray, you end with, in Jesus' name. Why do we do that? Because we've been taught to do that. Do you ever stop and think about what you're saying? It's not like you're signing off. You don't, you don't just do that because you're signing off and saying, I'm done with my prayer, therefore I say in Jesus' name so everybody knows I'm done with my prayer. You know what you're actually saying? When you pray and you add Jesus' name to it, you're saying, this is exactly the way that Jesus would pray for what I'm praying for. Yeah. You better think about what you're praying for. And, you know, up in heaven, God's saying, nope, 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 nope. Jesus saying, nope, nope. <laughs> that's not what I'd pray for. Nope, that's not it. But if you do pray in Jesus' name, but if you pray for the things that are in God's heart, you know what he says? Yes, it will be done. You want to have your prayers answered 100% of the time? Affirmative? Pray as Jesus would pray. There's other great patterns in the scripture for prayer. I love the Nehemiah, a wonderful book. I've mentioned that before. Daniel's prayer in chapter 9. Is an incredible prayer to look at. Jonah's prayer, which tells you you can pray anywhere, right? <laughs> you can even pray in a fish <laughs> if you had to. Paul's prayers in the New Testament, wonderful prayers as you look at his prayers. But really nowhere in the scripture do you find a greater pattern for prayer than the one that Jesus gave us, right? Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11. These prayers are known, or this pattern of prayer, is known as the Lord's Prayer. You all are familiar with that. You've heard it. One of the most famous prayers in all of the world, actually. And many of us uh, grew up and were taught to recite this verse as a prayer. In fact, in fact, in my early religious upbringing, I was instructed to say this prayer for punishment. Because what I would have to do, I'd have to go to the priest on Saturday, confess my sins, and he says, and for your punishment for being a bad person, and say, back here? Oh, okay. They'd tell me to go say 10 hour fathers because I was a bad person. In other words, you know what I related prayer to? Punishment. I, I, I had a really kind of a warped view of prayer. Uh, we know these verses uh, are not intended to be a prayer. We know that kind of for sure because the disciples asked Jesus, teach us what? 
Not, don't teach us a prayer, but teach us how to pray. And it's not that the disciples didn't know how to pray, by the way. These were Jewish people. Prayer was a huge part uh, of, the, of the Jewish community. Uh, prayer was recited in the morning, recited in the evening. Uh, incredible part of life was prayer. But in time, prayer became just words to recite from a book. They became uh, religious activity. It lost their true meaning in communion with God, very much like today. So what was it that prompted, that prompted them? They knew how to pray. They, they, they prayed. But what prompted them to ask Jesus, teach us how to pray? There may be a lot of reasons, but we know one for sure that's found in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Because it says this, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he had ceased, one of the disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us, how to pray. In other words, they observed something about Jesus' prayer life that they lacked and they desired. They said, that's not what we do, and that is not the way we pray, but oh boy, do we want that. Well, the pattern of the disciples' prayer is concise. There's no wasted words, unpretentious, no repetition, no ceremony, no posturing. And what Jesus taught his disciples on how to pray when understood, listen carefully. Here, here's the reason for the title, the pinnacle of worship. The pinnacle of worship. When you truly understand what the disciples' prayer is about, I believe this is the pinnacle of worship. Because the pattern unfolds our relationship with God and his majesty. How does it work? You guys know the prayer very well, right? This is the way it works. Our Father begins that way. Isn't that an incredible thing to say? Because we're children of God, we have access to the Father. It immediately speaks about what? Our intimacy with God. Secondly, the prayer goes on to say this, which art in heaven. It speaks about God being the sovereign God, the ruler He's our sovereign ruler. Hallowed be thy name speaks about his holiness. Thy kingdom come speaks about his faithfulness to his promises. Thy will be done speaks about him being the master of our lives. Give us this day. He's the provider in our life. Forgive us speaks about our Savior in our life. Lead us not speaks about him being our protector. And thine is the kingdom, the power and glory to come speaks about his majesty. I don't know if you grasp that, but that prayer is not about us. It's not about our needs. It's about God. When you understand this prayer, it's all about who God is and his greatness. Notice how the first half deals with God's glory. The second half deals with man's needs. Very similar to the Ten Commandments, right? You look at the Ten Commandments, they're split. First four deal with who? Who God is. Last part of it deals with man's needs. And why, the, why is the order significant? I, I'd really I encourage you to grasp this. Why is the order significant? That it begins with God, then it comes to us. Here's how, this is why it's so significant. Because when we pray and set God in his rightful place, when we pray and set God in his rightful place, understand our vertical relationship, it's going to redirect how we pray on the horizontal level. Once you start to understand the first part of that prayer, it'll change the second part of your prayer. When you understand that God is your loving Father, a loving Father is going to provide for you, right? Isn't he? When you understand that God is in control, that he's a faithful God, his kingdom's going to come, don't freak out. We don't have to freak out about what's going on. 
right? It's all those things. It's getting things in order, understanding that relationship that you have with God. No longer praying for the Lamborghini. Just saying, God, just give me a Ford Fiesta to get me to work and back. (laughs) I'll be good. (laughs) It puts things in perspective. The pattern for prayer, listen, also addresses three time dimensions side of this. It, 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 It addresses our present need, daily bread, right? Daily bread. It addresses our past. Forgive us our sins, right? That's the past. And it addresses the future needs of our life. Lead us not to the future in temptation. It also addresses our physical needs, bread, our mental need, forgiveness, and our spiritual need, lead us not. All prayer, all prayer, begins with recognizing and honoring the character of God. So what's the purpose of prayer? Why do we pray? I think it's a question we should ask. Do you guys realize, maybe you do, that you're not going to inform God of anything he doesn't know. Oh, by the way, God, I don't know if you know this, but I need something. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. Okay, The term is called omniscient. You know what omniscient means? He knows everything, past, present, and future. But there's some times where we come to God and kind of inform him as if he didn't, he goes, I missed it. I didn't know that. No, he's not going to do that. He He knows. He knows and he knows. Prayer is not to get to uh, have God um, agree with me. Like somehow we're going to negotiate. We're coming to the negotiating table and you know, we're going we're to go back and forth until we kind of twist God's arm and he's going to kind of turn our direction. And by the way, uh, prayer is not to make us comfortable. I enjoy being comfortable. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like pain. But do you realize that prayer is not to make us comfortable? Prayers to make us holy, right? You know that. You've heard that from the pulpit before. Prayers to make you holy, but not necessarily comfortable. I'm thankful to God for those moments of peace and comfort. I rejoice when that happens, and there's other times when life's difficult. So what is the ultimate reason we pray? This is significant. And here's what it is. Prayer is affirming. Prayer is affirming the sovereignty of God in my life It is to declare his majesty. It is taking my will and making it submissive to his will. That's what it is. That's what prayer is for. It's to glorify God is what it is. It's to lift up his name, exalt his holiness, promote his agenda. It is an expression of our total dependence on him. Total dependence. I would assume that you guys have taken a few breaths while you've been here, right? You've been sucking up some air. That don't belong to you. (laughs) That all belongs to God, right? If If we all would step back a little bit and think about how dependent are we on God. Oh my goodness. We're dependent on Him for everything. Everything. We're dependent on God. Jesus affirmed the purpose of righteous prayer in John 14, 13, when he said this, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, and look at what he says, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. See, God will always be glorified when we come to him in prayer, confessed up with the right motives and with requests that glorify his name. We'll finish with this, the practice of prayer. It's all well that we uh, know the priority of prayer. It's, it's important you know that. It's important you know the patterns that God has given us for prayer and the purpose of prayer. But it does us no good unless we pray, right? I mean, you've got to pray. So how do we put into practice what we've learned on how to pray? Well, let me uh, clear up some misconceptions. You can pray any time. We already discussed that. You're never put on hold. You can pray long prayers. By the way, in, in the uh, 
book of Nehemiah. That's probably the longest prayer you'll, you'll find. You can, short, you can pray short prayers. You know what the shortest prayer in the scripture is? Peter, Lord help me. <laughs> this is going down. Short prayers are great. You can pray in any posture. You can pray standing, sitting, lying down, walking, running, kneeling, on one foot, one eye open, eyes closed, except for driving. Otherwise, that prayer gets you to heaven, right? That'll be a prayer, God, anyway. Hands up, hands down, hands folded, it doesn't matter. To this day, I still remember being taught how I was supposed to hold my hands and cross my thumbs, you know. <laughs> and I was told, unless you do this, God will not hear your prayers. You have to do this. <laughs> Paul concludes his uh, epistle, and you've heard John say his probably his favorite book in the scripture is Ephesians. And it is an incredible book. Again, you've heard the first half of it speaks about your position in Christ. The last half speaks about the practical living skills that you live out because of your position in Christ. But in this incredible book, Paul um, concludes this incredible book, I thought, with an incredible statement. He, deal, he, he concludes it with prayer, how to pray. In light of everything he's talked about, he says, now we're going to talk about how we put the bow on what I just spoke about, and that's prayer. And this is what he says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and applications for all saints. Now, if you look at this prayer or this statement, there are four alls, four alls. I wonder if uh, Paul was like from the South, because sometimes he says y'all, right? Did you ever see the scripture? Or is this y'all kind of? Um, so the first all that you see in this uh, verse is the frequency of prayer. We talked about that a little bit. In other words, praying always. It's similar to what Paul commanded in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, where he says praying without ceasing. So praying without ceasing doesn't mean 24-7, that you're up you know, every, every waking hour, because we need to sleep, right? You need to know that we need to sleep. But to pray without ceasing is to keep, listen, our line of communication open with God 24-7. It's living, here it is, it's living your life in God consciousness. That's what it is. Living your life in God consciousness. Living a life in constant communication and communion with God. In other words, you're bringing to God all your thoughts, all your deeds, all your circumstances. Here's the second all. You have to pray with all prayer and supplication. Kind of an interesting verse. Simply means the first one, prayer, just means general prayer. Supplication means more specific requests. And we're to pray for things in general. We're to pray for things specific. Now look at you guys here. You have a son that's in the military. And I know you pray, you pray two different ways. I've heard you pray two different ways. You pray for the military in general, right? Just in general. All the people who are serving in the military. But you know what else they pray for? Their son. Specifically, their son. And God says when we pray, we're to pray in general, and we're to pray specific. But I want you to also see one thing that Paul adds. He says, all prayer and supplication what it says, in the spirit, in the spirit. See, at the core, it means to pray with the mind and the assistance of the Holy Spirit. In the book of um, Romans, chapter 8, verse 26, it says this, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray as we ought. You know how you should begin your prayer when you pray? Holy Spirit, help me to pray. That's, that's what it's saying, right? We don't know how, and the Holy Spirit's there to help us, so you bring him into your prayer life. Here's the third all. Paul says, watching thereunto with all perseverance or perseverance and supplication. He again reminds us of pers uh, persevering in prayer. In other words, stick to it. 
Stick to your prayer. Stay at it. Hang in there. And our prayer comes by listening carefully, watching and being alert to the issues around us. Jesus said this, watch and pray. Watch and pray. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, watch unto prayer. In other words, you can't properly pray unless you know what is going on. And when your heart is filled with prayer, when your heart's filled with prayer, it's because you're alert to what's going on around you. Right? Be, be very aware. Be very aware of what's going on in our country so you'll know how to pray for our country. Be very aware of what's going on in your families to know how to pray for them. Be very aware of what's going on in work so you'll know how to pray when you go to work. Be a very alert of what's going on. Pay attention. And here's the last one. Pray always with a variety of prayers, alert to what's going on around us, and lastly, for all, all saints. All saints. What does that mean? It means you pray for the good ones, the bad ones, and the ugly ones, right? <laughs> and now why do I tell you that? Why do I tell you that? You've got to understand what Paul faced in his ministry. If we think it was all fun and games, it was all just kumbaya, and everybody was just getting along, you have missed it. He dealt with some difficult Christians in his life. Really difficult. But you know what he says? Regardless, it doesn't matter if they're difficult or not. You need to pray for them. And you need to pray for the good ones. Don't assume that because somebody's doing well, that they don't need your prayer. Oh, no, don't go there. <laughs> they need you to be praying. Praying for them. So why do we pray for one another? Are you asking? happens when we pray for one another. God is going to speak to you how to minister to that person. I know we pray, oh God, they need some help. They're really hurting. <laughs> God sends somebody. Yeah. Right? The heart should be this. God, they're hurting. Is there any way, God, I could be a solution to the problem? God, it's me, God. Send me. Right? Isn't it so easy to send somebody else? Oh, that's so easy. Or, or you think somebody else can do it better? Don't, don't do that. If God says, I'm sending you, you're the best one that God wants to use. I think it's interesting in this whole thing is that we pray for ourselves. I think when we are lost in the needs of others, listen, we're lost in the needs of others, often our needs become more into perspective. I know you guys have shared this probably with other people. I've done it as well. When I think I'm having some problems in my life, when I go talk to somebody who's having greater problems, I go, hey, my problems are <laughs> That's when people are hurting worse than me. But listen, prayer is going to bind us together. Prayer. Paul always prayed for Everyone else, I love this passage in 1 Samuel 12, 23. We've got nothing about the passage, but it says this, God forbid, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord and stops and, and, and ceasing to pray for you. This guy thought it would be a sin just to stop praying for somebody. My goodness, we should have more praying for people. I want to let you know that a sin, church, has offered incredible opportunities for you to pray. Wonderful opportunities. Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, we meet here for prayer. And what are we doing when we're meeting for prayer? You know what we're asking you? Fill this place with your spirit, first of all. God, that you be glorified. We pray for you as you're waking up in the morning. That God has put an incredible desire for you to meet him fresh in the we pray for the needs of the church. There are certain things that Pastor John has prayer for us that are very specific that we pray for. This morning we pray for SLAM, for what John is doing next door with the kids. We pray for our country. We pray for the church. We should be praying for our country every day. Every day. So, um, 9 o'clock, please come. 
Get to know some people. Pray with them. Share your heart. You may have some needs in your own life that we can pray for. That room right over there, where the double doors are. Sunday morning is a prayer room. And what we've been doing in the last number of weeks is we're asking, tapping people on the shoulder and say, hey, could you one Sunday go to the prayer room and just pray through the service? While the service is going on here, pray for what God's going to do in the hearts of people. And I've uh, had some people come and say, you know, man, I, I don't think I can pray for an hour. That's a bit, it's pushing the envelope a little bit. You know, it's interesting when they come out, they say, I could do that. I was able to do that. And we have plenty of prayer requests in there. Just a list of things that are going to keep you busy for greater than an hour. But you see my wife, Jenny, and she'll put you on the list and encourage you to do it. It's a transforming time in your life. We have a prayer chain. Prayer chain is you calling into the church if there's something on your heart. Um, I just got a call from Rosalie uh, this week for someone who was in the hospital we need to pray for. Uh, that, we can get you involved with that as well. On Wednesdays, this coming Wednesday, once a month, we meet for something called Praise and Prayer. And what we do on that uh, particular day is that we come and we sing and praise God for music. And then we start to look again at prayer. And what we're going to do, and God really kind of shifted my heart a little bit, we're going to uh, continue with studying the disciples' prayer in, in small little bits, because my whole desire was, as a church, we need to learn to play, pray biblically. Not just to pray, but to pray biblically. And what better place is there to learn that than what Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Then there's interpersonal prayer. Interpersonal prayer is just when you come uh, Sunday. I would encourage you, when you come to somebody, just please ask them, how can I pray for you? It's one of the great things we can do for one another. Isn't it? How simple is that? Really? How simple? Scripture tells us in Hebrews, one of the reasons we gather together is what? To encourage one another to love and good deeds, right? And one of the ways you can encourage one another is just praying to them, saying, you're on my heart, and I'll be praying for you. And as you pray for them, could you please be open to what God has for you to minister to them, maybe beyond just prayer? So, um, that's it. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a big topic, and I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to you know, put something together with a big topic, sometimes a little difficult. But here I want to end with this. This is from uh, Leonard Ravenhill. Uh, there, there's some people who God has given just words to put together, kind of put things in perspective. It says this. The church has many organizers, a few agonizers. Many players, a few prayers. Many resters, a few wrestlers. Many interferers, a few who are interceders. Many fashion with little passion. A worldly Christian will stop praying, and a praying Christian will start will stop worldliness. Ties may build a church, but tears will give it life. That is the difference between the modern church and the early church. In a matter of effective prayer. Never have so many left, so much to so few. What a great passage. Can I encourage you to become people of prayer? Let's go to prayer. So, Father, we're so grateful for our time together. Your work is such a powerful tool in our life. But there's this other part that requires our will. My prayer, God. Is that God, you would change us to be people who are prayer warriors. Uh, we can understand and we can read and we can dissect all that you would have to say. But until we start to pray, it'll do us no good. 
We are in a critical, critical time in history. Not only for our country, but it's really on the brink of destruction. For God, the whole world, as we look at the plan that you have for end time starting to become more and more real. And we need to pray. And we need to see. So for all who are here, as people raise up the needs in their life, would we all God be in his name? Understand the majesty of our God, of who you are, and really how much you can love us. So great. Your patience and love for us. The Father, we pray that you be honored, that you be praised. In the time God has spent together, Jesus' name. So every now and then, we'll do a song that you can put your e on. I uh, personally um, enjoy uh, a lot of the old country um, praise music. Uh, I think it has a really heart to it. And um, Christy um, is going to uh, put on her yeehaw. Uh, she uh, surprised me. She's got a twin, but she can do twins. Yeah. 
you're new to um, our church, we do have this blue card somewhere. Charles has it. Raise up your hand. We'd love to give you a gift. This is your first time here. And uh, just fill out one of these cards. Also, if you have a prayer need or prayer request, there's a red colored card behind the seat. Please fill that out. Drop it in the offering box. And we have an amazing group of folks that will lift these requests up um, whenever we get together. Our leadership, and then on Wednesday night, Pastor Mike is going to be uh, leading our prayer our, our prayer service, and it's then when we're also going to be looking up some of the needs. Next slide, Mark. Oh, it's already up. Happy 4th of July. I'm not sure what you guys have planned today, but we were talking this morning about how blessed we are to be born in this amazing place. Keep this country Lifted up in your prayers, going through a lot of um, a lot of transformation, a lot of changes. Um, man, what an opportunity for us as the body of Christ to uh, be present and to give people hope uh, like never before. So happy Fourth! Okay, I want to remind everybody. Charles has copies of this, and they're also in the foyer. Our July communique is out, and in that uh, thing, he's you he can hand them out on the way out. Grab one, please, because it kind of lays out. Who's um, uh, what's going on throughout the throughout the month of July? We have our men's group next Monday, which I'll read, but it's all in this. I think most churches call them bulletins. We choose to be like the Russians and call communicates. Whatever it is, that was a Larry thing. I, I kind of like that, right? Your bulletin is that kind of. I guess if there was a bulletin, we could sell ads. It's called a bulletin. Okay. Hey, who's going up tomorrow? Cool, awesome. Join me up front right after church because I've got a little uh, one-page handout and uh, kind of let you know what's going on, what time we're meeting at Fort Marcy and all those little minute details. We were supposed to do this last week, but um, I ended up having to meet with some folks. So join me right immediately after service, and I've got this little handout for everybody. Uh, worship Wednesday, this Wednesday, so join us at 7 o'clock. Again, Pastor Mike and I will be leading that service we just come together, sing some songs, some worship songs, and then break out into small groups where we're able to pray. And he leads that effort. I love Worship Wednesday nights. Mark this on your calendar. It's the first Wednesday of every month is when we have or hold our Worship Wednesday. Those of you that have been joining me on Saturday mornings, the second Saturday of every month, we have our men's group. Uh, it's called Summit, and that's kind of what we're going to be doing at... Um, Baldy tomorrow, you guys are going to be pulling me up that last day. And I'm grateful for. We were talking about the shirtless 
in the other room this morning. So uh, if you don't know who those are, um, they're pretty cool. Anyway, uh, join me for our Second Timothy study. Also, beginning next Wednesday, uh, the 14th, Larry's going to begin, Larry Socher is going to begin a series uh, titled uh, About for a Kingdom and a Throne, which those of you might not know, that's the theme of the Bible. There's a battle for a kingdom and a throne playing out right before our eyes. It's going to be a three, maybe four week series just to kind of um, connect dots for us as a church uh, as it relates to some of the current events, some of the things that are happening and how they relate uh, to the Word of God or how the Word of God reveals to us some of the things that we're all dealing with. And then again, I want to let everybody know that every Sunday morning, is anybody in there today, Jenny, or not? I don't think so. There is. There's always somebody in that room praying during the service, praying for the service. So if you would like to be a part of that, see uh, Jenny Hanetta over here, and she will get you on her list. We would love for you to be a part. And uh, what an amazing thing. I know for me personally, I know when there's somebody in there praying when we're up here. And uh, what a blessing that is. So if you want to be a part of that every Sunday morning, during the preaching, and the, actually the praise and the preaching, there's somebody in that room lifting this up. We also put our prayer points up in the room so that that could be a part. Okay, we're on Facebook Live as we speak, and then this afternoon it'll be archived to YouTube so you can access Pastor Mike's sermon today. Share it with everybody. Uh, subscribe to our web thing, our web, not our web thing, but our YouTube channel. And uh, hey, we also have our new website up, right? So get on that. That's already there. AscentBible.Church. And um, we'll point you to some of these, uh, these social media platforms that we use. So um, again, thank you everybody for um, being here. Happy 4th. Uh, Teresa, welcome home. Had a great time with Lauren this morning. I put him in a headlock a couple of times, but he's all good. Um, but anyway, happy 4th, everyone. We love you. Have a great week. And... Uh, Let's keep lifting up each other in prayer. Uh, see you once again. Anything that I might have left off, anybody? Say again. Oh, of course. Hey, there's refreshments in the room next door.